Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Web Platform Podcast. Episode number 181. Today, we're talking about design things. Woo! We are a host this week, Justin Ribeiro and Danny Blue. Danny, how's it going? It's going pretty good. I think I'm a drone person now. Are you a drone person now? I know I was just watching you fly a drone around your head. I didn't know if it was coming off your brainwaves or not, but I like to believe you can control machines with your mind. So I, I think I think it's official. I bought one uh, little mini indoor drone, and now I've done nothing the past few days, especially over the weekend, other than review uh, other larger drones, which I must have. <laughs> of course, that, uh, that only makes that only makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's fine. You might as well just dive head on into a hobby, right? No, no, uh, no regard for anything else. No, of course not. If you can wire it to the, you know, web Bluetooth, you're gold. That's that's you know, small yep. small things, small things in the world. Uh, Leon is on vacation at this point in time, so uh, we're gonna throw it over to Danny this week, who's gonna talk about this week in the web in two minutes or less. Danny, thank you, Justin. Kenneth Auchenberg, a PM over on the VS Code team, released Browser Preview, a real browser preview inside of your editor that you can debug. Behind the scenes, it uses Chrome Headless. Expect to see Kenneth on the show in the coming weeks. There's a new guide for the Web Auth N API that's landing in browsers that helps to demystify just how this can further secure user information online. Intersection Observer V2 recently popped up on Blink's intent to ship with the primary purpose to prevent pervasive forms of fraud, such as clickjacking and UI redress attacks. The explainer is up on GitHub. There is a new roadmap for Yarn V2 with a significant amount of changes and feature additions planned, including a plugin API and a port to TypeScript. Thank you, Danny. Interesting things on the platform this week. Uh, I'm still amazed that people are getting so many things done, given that it's still really only (laughs) mid-January. Uh, I feel unproductive at this point. So, uh, speaking of unproductive things, I am not super awesome at design. Danny, how's your design acumen? So I actually started out being a designer. That's what I went to school for. Um, so like my first job out of college, I was designing, uh, even doing a lot of print stuff, uh, for a swimming pool manufacturer. So I will say that I thought I used to be okay at it maybe, uh, but I don't really know now, like working with our designers here, I'm like, oh man, they're much, much better at this than me. Well, in that case, then I guess we're both going to learn something today and let's uh, good point to introduce our guest, Eric Kennedy, Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Danny. How's it going guys? Not too bad. So, Eric, for those out there who don't know you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah. So my name is Eric Kennedy. And uh, Danny, I guess <clears throat> my story is actually kind of the opposite of you. I studied software engineering in school. And oh, yeah, uh, and then kind of meandered my way over to design um, via PM, of course. Uh, but yeah, like uh, started out programming in college found it super, super cool, uh, decided that's what I was definitely going to do with my life, and then got into the industry and found out that like programming side projects and little personal projects is a ton of fun, but also nothing like just kind of the industrial scale, like programming for a medium or large company. Um, And so I decided, okay, I'm going to figure out something else to do. Made my way eventually to UX design and that was a lot of fun, but I had this experience with my clients where um, a, l- a lot of them, I'd hand over these wireframes and they would say, hey, like this is these are nice. I-, I see that these are usable. This is the app that we want, except it doesn't look like an app, right? It's just wireframes and, and we need someone to take it and make it look how we want to implement it. And our devs probably aren't going to be the best people for that. Can you do that? And like any good freelancer should, I said, yes, of course I can do that. And then scrambled to figure out how. Um, And it was a bit of a mess, but I just kind of had to like teach myself design, try and find out, you know, go through the web, read different articles on it, kind of scramble through Dribbble, try and find out like with every little thing that I started designing, it's like, okay, I'm going to make a button here. Well, it's not obvious if you've never designed like what constitutes a good button or what doesn't, right? Like, what color do you make it? That's a big choice. What font? Those, those are two huge questions, even with one little element. Um, 
and that's let alone shadows and border radius and any other effects and styling. And so it was just a lot of work trying to like piece together. How do I take these designs that I've made, which pretty universally, like just looked really bad. And how do I actually make them look better? How do I make them look like, like a professional designer did them? And so uh, going through that process, like kind of gave me the perspective that design can actually be approached way more analytically uh, than than you would typically give it credit for or that you would typically expect, um, which is great news for developers because it's, yeah, like the analytical approach really can work in making a design look better. So uh, from there, uh, I've been a designer for a few years now. And um, at some point, uh, I ended up creating a course around a lot of the stuff that I had had to teach myself. It's called Learn UI Design. And uh, it's sort of like a lot of that um, analytical approach to design all wrapped up in, in one course. And then I've also, I'm writing on a blog, Learn UI Design, Learn UI dot design slash blog. And that's got a lot of uh, a, a lot of the articles that I've written over the years. And it's just sort of the same story, just really trying to break things down. And instead of saying, hey, design is kind of this art school magic that you either can or can't do, and you're kind of born that way. Um, instead, say, like, let's break this down piece by piece, analyze different components, different styles, and see how we can recreate that. So one of the things that I find really interesting about uh, about design in general is that a lot of times it's as much about what what not to do as much as, oh, this is the thing you should do, which uh, which can be tough, especially if you're coming at it, like I said, if you're pretty green in a lot of that stuff. So with that and through, you know, like you know, trying to teach a lot of this stuff, what are a lot of, you know, rookie mistakes uh, that people make? Oh, yeah, that's such a good question. Um, so there's dozens of them. And actually, uh, in this course, I have this sh sh this sheet printed out on my wall 20 things to know and no. uh 20 things to know is just 20 rookie mistakes that beginning designers make um and it's part of the learn UI design course so it's like i could just list all those but um i mean some of the most common ones some of the ones that are like easiest to fix are rookie designers tend to use uh centered text too much they tend to use colored text too much color text is actually kind of a non-obvious one if you look at most really good designs you're going to see very little color text almost all of it is going to be gray and when i say gray i'm going to almost always mean inclusive of black and white um it's basically always going to be gray um so yeah there's just gonna be too much color and text for rookie designs uh, and then there's also it's Using too much color in general is just one of the easiest ways to screw up a nice, neat, and clean design. So at least when you're starting out in design, I think it's always better to err on the side of using too little color or just kind of like using it as an accent or a pop here and there rather than saying, hey, I'm going to make this like all out rainbow theme. It's going to be super neon and bright and crazy. Like that's very tough to pull off. So those are a couple things. So you said one thing that I always find interesting about when talking about design, you said clean design. Yeah. So like, I remember, especially when I was in school and I would be learning about some of these things and, you know, you'd get up in front of the class and do a presentation. What clean ended up meaning for the most part was I didn't do a lot of stuff, meaning that it was very, very simple. Um, so in general, I'm curious if do are clean designs always simple designs? And if, and if not, how do you kind of make that distinction or how do you identify what is a clean design? Yeah, I don't really mean too much by the term. Like I'm just kind of using it in the same way that I hear, hear it used all the time, like by my clients, uh, by students. People just say, yeah, I'm kind of looking for something clean and simple. And that's very much what's in style right now. I guess you could say like back in 2013 or the years just preceding that, we had much more skeuomorphic designs, right? Where we had the lickable buttons, as Steve Jobs said, um, and we have more shadows and gradients and textures imitating the real world, like metal and, and glass and all that. And so that's really taken a step back. I think most people nowadays, um, like their, their aesthetic tastes are, yeah, we want something that's a little stripped of that. Not necessarily entirely. Of course, you still have shadows and gradients, and but it's not, we're not really obsessed with making our interfaces imitate the real world in every capacity these days. Um, and uh, clean and simple, in my opinion, is also, it's kind of a virtue um, in that 
if you're going to make something clean and simple, you really have to consider exactly what you can strip away from it. Uh, you have to do some tough work and say, listen, I have the option to put all of this stuff on my page or all of these features in my app. Um, I mean, like making an app clean and simple is like the visual analog of not having feature creep, right? It's like not having that visual creep of, oh, well, let's just add in this and this and this. So making something simple, like this is a, um, a realization that my students have again and again. It's like, they'll come and they'll say, hey, like, I never realized how difficult it was to make something simple because it is all that work in getting things just aligned perfectly, perfectly consistent um, and and stripping out everything that's, unnecessary. So yeah, simple is great, but it does take a surprising amount of work to get there. Yeah. Oftentimes when you talk about simple, you know, there is that notion that uh, design has to be adaptable these days. I mean, beforehand we had such a sort of singular target of things, you know, Danny was talking about the notion of, you know, he used to be in print you know, and doing those sorts of things. And those had really particular types of outputs. But today on the web and on a lot of platforms, things uh, simple and the notion that it has to be adaptive are very difficult to sort of achieve uh, together, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's so you're talking about adapting across different screen sizes and devices. Well, anything from different screen sizes, screen sizes to different accessibility guidelines, the notion of contrast on on things. Uh, you know, a lot of times when I hear folks talk about design, they're thinking just the notion this looks good, mm -hmm. right? Or this is functionally okay for me. And really, design encapsulates a lot more th sort of uh, groups of not just people, but also. Uh, groups of uses around that thing and the adaptive nature of, uh, you know, the notion of a button, for instance, uh, is not necessarily the same uh, when you you think about a lot of sort of the uh, the way the actual world is where screens are dim and the lighting's bad or eyesight is, you know, is failing and things of that nature. I mean, how do you go from, hey, I've got a very simple button to, I have this very simple adaptive button that sort of meets those needs. Is that, is that, has that gotten particularly easier over time? Um, so I'm not sure I totally understand the question because you're like, I get the accessibility concern, right? You're saying, how do I, how do I, uh, make sure that say the text contrast ratio is okay on the button um, and give it a, uh, at least if it's a, a web, um, a web component, then you want to make sure as you're tabbing through or using something besides a keyboard, you have a, um, a state that shows that. Um, so I get that. Uh, those things like coming up with solutions for those definitely get easier over time. If you kind of see the range of patterns that are out there. Um, I could talk about, I'm not sure if that's really going to address your question though. Like I could talk about a little bit more about say accessibility and, and how to get a good color contrast ratio. Um, sure. Okay. Yeah. We'll go down that path. Um, so this is one thing where I think a lot of times beginning designers, you, you look at, um, you just, you take the colors that are in your design already and you run them through some contrast ratio checker. Um, I know I particularly like Stark, which is a plugin for Sketch. Um, and you find that oh, in all likelihood, like maybe <clears throat> it passes AA recommendations. It doesn't, it like often doesn't pass AAA recommendations. And you go to adjust things and you just don't really know which way you should, like which way to adjust uh, either of your colors to get that contrast ratio. So one helpful hint there is um, if you're working in an app like Sketch or Figma, they have an, a color mode called HSB. And this is way more useful to be in than trying to name colors in hex or in RGB. And um, if you have, let's say you have a color on a white background, and but just take the inverse of what I'm about to say if you have a lighter color on a darker background. But if you have some color on a white background and you're trying to get some contrast between the color and white, um, you basically, in the HSB color system, you have these three knobs or these three levers that you can adjust to um, increase that contrast with white. So in HSB, uh, so without explaining the entire color system, um, I actually have an article on this online. If you just search uh, HSB, a practitioner's primer, you'll find it. Um, but basically, uh, you can 
bright, you can modify the brightness directly. You can modify that down. So if you have some color, let's say you have some green and you found out it's not appropriately contrasted against a white background, you're going to move the brightness down. You're going to move the saturation up. And then for the hue, hue is a value between zero and 360 measured in degrees. And for the hue, you're going to move it towards whatever it is closest to out of R, G, or B, which are at zero degrees, 120 degrees, and 240 degrees. So if you had some sort of like off green, let's say you had some some, some, some kind of teal, like um, something more in the range of like Twitter's theme color or something, um, those colors can be tough to get right and to get accessible because those blues, those teals are just naturally kind of light colors. So if you want them to contrast against white, oftentimes... Like I said, you'll want to adjust the saturation up, you'll move the brightness down, and then you'll move the hue up towards 240. And just doing those things, just kind of tweaking them a little bit at a time, you can often get to an appropriately contrasted um, pair of colors with very little modification of the color itself. You can, you're basically traversing the minimum distance that you need to. And so it's not going to appear like some totally different shade of blue if you, you know, if you're using it um, in one instance where you need it to be accessible. So like, that's one helpful hint around there. But I, uh, I think you did have kind of a broader question too. It just strikes me that design, you know, a lot of times when people hear the word design, it, it comes with it with a certain sort of level of connotation. And with design, I mean, there's lots of types of sort of visual design out there, right? When we talk about sort of um, what someone might see, whether that's uh, your typical identity sort of design that sort of might shape the colors and theming of a particular site or application to sort of the uh, user experience, you know, that interactive design element to it, uh, which, you know, takes into account motion uh, and uh, sort of uh, that, uh, that guiding sort of principle that leads people into particular paths within our, within our sites or applications. Uh, it just strikes me that it's, it's so, it seems so very difficult to me as someone who's not a designer to sort of grok or grasp all those things uh, to become <laughs> somewhat uh, productive uh, within within those elements uh, if, as you're trying to sort of merge what design wants with what the code needs and, you know, fundamentally what the end user will end up using. Uh, the adaptability of all those things together seems um, difficult to me. Uh, w would you say that those things sort of inter inter uh, sort of intersperse or, or cross-functional in your mind? Do, do you find it easier as, you know, the web has gotten more interactive, for instance, and then platforms have added, you know, the ability to do more, you know, uh, performantly, you know, with more more frames per second, more, uh, uh, the better ability to control motion graphics, for instance, and all that. Uh, do, do you find that design has gotten harder or simpler as sort of our, our, our reach of expanse has <laughs> improved? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's probably gotten harder. Um, I mean, if you just consider like the difference between, say, designing for a poster, which is always the same size, it's not always viewed from the same distance, right? But it's always the same size. It's it's pretty static as far as things go. Like even <clears throat> designing for the website that has the least amount of user generated content, um, or like a blog or something. It's like then you have you might say, okay, I'm going to pick a title or whatever. And the size that you want for that title depends on how long those titles are. Like every newspaper probably has some guidelines on how long headlines can be, right? Because um, you don't want one that's like 50 words or whatever. Uh, and so then there's these constraints and those kind of the content and the design has this like chicken and egg issue. Um, and this comes up, I mean, this is like one thing that some designers talk about is designing with real data. Like it's very tempting to just kind of use some lorem ipsum text, put that in your design, make it look pretty and call it a day. And I think it's far better to, to the degree that you can to design with real data, um, to, to use the actual, say, headlines. If you're, if you're creating some site for a newspaper, use the actual headlines and bylines and dates and stuff. Use the actual imagery that your paper has access to um, because you want to see how that looks before you go ahead and code all this up. And there's going to be differences. If you just pick kind of the most beautiful imagery that you can find or like these, you know, just use these Latin um, filler text or whatever, uh, it's really going to have a different effect. And you want to understand 
Like the purpose of, of these design tools is to see something before it's actually built and decide if that's what you want to build. So like, that's one thing. And so, yeah, there's this complication, right? Going from posters to the web. But then, I mean, the responsive web is, is a whole other layer on top of that. Because now all of a sudden, let's say you have some image that you're using on a, on a mobile size. And not only do you have the technical concerns of like, do we have this I image in a high enough resolution where we can use it on larger devices and still have that be a pleasant experience. Um, but you have these concerns where like the screen isn't even, you don't even have close to the same amount of canvas, right? Some like watches and phone and, and low end phones are like, you have somewhere around 300 points of width. And then you have these giant monitors, which are closer to 3000 points as a full order of magnitude of screen widths that you're going over. Um, and so what's going to work on the smallest ones is definitely not going to just like always directly apply to the largest ones and vice versa. And so then you have this problem of kind of needing to like understand the concepts that work at different scales and then gently slide from like as your scale gets larger and larger, your devices change, kind of slide from those small mobile design concepts to to larger ones and some of this is like captured in responsive design patterns um but it, it is complicated right like device capabilities change and there's all kinds of things to consider so i think in that sense yeah it's it has gotten harder so from so from some potentially more abstract stuff uh, back into some very i guess very specific things we've talked about color and fonts and stuff color a lot and then and then fonts a little bit and i think fonts or uh, typography in general is where some people often get in trouble um is there is there a bare minimum like are there you know like a few bare minimum things that you should know um about dealing with color and typography uh for example <laughs> so uh, any designer i've worked with knows that i have a pet peeve of how many shades of gray designers like to use um, sure. I get tired of having my, it's like, okay, here's my light gray. And then my light gray, mid gray, dark gray. All right. But this is a slightly darker gray. And then, oh, this is an even lighter gray now. Um, so, so when you're dealing with typography and color specifically, are there, a, are there a few core tenets that you should keep in mind? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, and the gray thing really ties in. I would say <clears throat> for beginning designers, one of the things that you should definitely be familiar with if you want to get good at color is using gray. And, uh, oh man, I feel like I'm just going to kind of egg you on here because, uh, you really often do need quite a few shades of gray to design something appropriately. Um, like gray is nice in that, uh, as a color, it doesn't attract attention to itself. If it's kind of the only thing you use, you you're only working with the contrast dimension, right? You have darker grays and lighter grays and, say white text on some gray or or gray text or whatever on, on some lighter color. Um, so you sort of stripped out all those dimensions of trying to inject a, a hue into them. And, and then all of a sudden you're dealing with a color that can be not only lighter, or darker, but more or less saturated and so on. So um, gray is really simple in that regard. It's a really good tool. Um, but the purpose of gray, like the way I look at it is the purpose of gray is really to help direct a user's attention around designs. Um, and so like, I think it's very frequent that you, how the different grays that you're using, it's like a really, um, it could be really subtle in terms of if how exactly how noticeable you want something to be. So let's say you have a byline that's below a header, like here's the blog post and it's by Eric Kennedy and whatever. Um, so that byline certainly is going to attract less attention than the header, right? Uh, so you might certainly have it be a lighter color, but also like then you're going to have some body text and um, and the body text is also in some sense attracting less attention to the header, but it doesn't feel secondary in the same way that the byline might be. And so then, okay, it's like you have at least, say you're just making a grayscale site, you have at least two shades of gray there, but then do you really want the header and the... Um, and the body text to have the same gray. In some cases, it's totally fine. Um, in some cases, you might say, no, actually, actually not. You know, maybe, maybe if you're using some bold weight for the header, it's just coming off really strong. So you actually want to lighten it just a bit, not to make it look secondary. It's still kind of the most important thing on the page, but just to like take the edge off. And yet for your body text, the main concern is readability. And so you have a darker gray. So like there's a simple example where you've kind of 
wound up with three different slightly different shades of gray and i think there's not really any problem there but all apologies to anyone who has to develop my designs um, that that t that, t that totally makes sense. It's it's just, um, like I said it, it is something. It is something that is kind of kind of curious, just because I've I always I always see it, and I never really knew why, other than just like, well, why can't this gray be the same as the other gray that we already used somewhere else? Yeah, and uh, it's a good question, and I and I totally get it. Um, the thing I would stress is for all designers is like make sure you can articulate why they are different, uh, because. Uh, Hopefully, a designer is aware of exactly why why he or she is doing all the things that they're doing. Um, but not all are. And I realize that some people would maybe do that and it would be the right solution and there would be good rationales for it, but they just can't happen to, to articulate that. <clears throat> um, we keep going on that color bit too, talking about kind of like what's the bare minimum that you should know about yeah. color. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, please. So I think one of the biggest things with color is um, if you just sort of poke around the design internet and, and read design blogs and stuff, you're going to come away with the impression that color palettes and color theory are really, really important. And at least in my experience, I when I was, you know, when I first started out, I'd have these apps and these screens that would just look really bad. I'd go read some article about color theory. I'm like, okay, maybe what I need is a split complementary palette. I try and like kind of <clears throat> shoehorn it into the design. And it would never help. It, it would like it was always useless, and it might generate you know this these swatches that look really nice next to one another, but the actual end effect was always that it it didn't seem to help me in any capacity. Um, so color theory, I was just like very skeptical of. And Danny, you said you were in um, you went to art school or design school. I'd be curious to hear like how much this kind of stuff was pushed there. Um, but what I what I ended up finding was like the most useful thing for me was really viewing color as um, the primary skill around color for designers should be thought of as adjusting color. So you start with one base color and maybe it's something that is like suggested by your logo. Maybe you picked blue because whatever, you're a bank and you're boring. Maybe, you know, whatever, whatever color you picked, you use it in some places and that's kind of your primary theme color. Uh, let's say you use it for some call to action, some button somewhere. Uh, but then you have, say, that same color appear as a background. And when it's appearing as a background, there's so many more pixels filled with that color. So using the same exact color is, it's just gonna come off as really, really strong. Or if you use the same exact color, you can no longer have that button show up on that background. So like if you look at many, many apps that look good and, and just look designed and are professionally designed, you're gonna see that they'll take that, that color and they'll adjust it. Um, and again, this is something that's very easy to do in the HSB color system. So do check that out if you haven't used it. But uh, you can do that a lot of times by modifying the saturation and brightness and just kind of leaving the hue the same. Um, I actually have another article that's on this. It's called uh, Color and UI Design, a Practical Framework. And it just goes over like a lot of the fundamentals of this adjusting color as being the core color skill of user interface design. But as far as a bare minimum goes, that's what I would say is like, get good at grays. Notice how the apps that you like use grays and start to try and repeat that. There's almost always gonna be, for beginning designers, gonna be more usage of grays than you might otherwise expect. And then also start to think of adjusting colors rather than like taking that palette model where you find some beautiful five swatch color palette and just kind of, you know, dab the paint on and color your pixels. It's like, that's not how I've found most color to work in the real world. That's very cool. Um, so, so now, so, I, so in, in, in my experience, in school for me was was quite was quite a while ago. So a lot of this stuff I don't remember. Uh, but I do remember talking about. I do remember having entire classes about typography. Um, if you are, and I would say now it's like I usually just pick like one default. Like if I'm building something on my own, I pick one default system font, and I just uh, and I just go with it. And obviously, typography is is a bit more than that. Um, what, what are what are some of the what is the least you need to know to make even just to make good choices about what your about how you select fonts and font weights and letting and kerning and that kind of thing? 
Sure. So I would say that, I mean, first of all, letting and kerning is is basically not even going to be in that bare minimum. Um, it's not going to be in that bare bones curriculum. I would say there's two kind of two skills that you need to get good at, at at a bare minimum. One is picking fonts and then the other is styling them. And picking fonts gets a lot of airtime, right? Again, if you're if you're kind of Googling around and going to design blogs and stuff, you see all this stuff on picking fonts and or, or pairing fonts together, which I guess is really a subset of picking fonts. Um, but for the most part, you pick fonts once for your project, and then you just spend the rest of the project styling them. You use that font that you picked, and we'll just say you pick one or whatever. You use that one font that you picked, and then you're 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 spending more time styling it. Um, so that's really the essential skill. But um, I would say the bare minimum. For picking fonts, I think the easiest thing to do is just to really try and find apps and sites that you like, that you know are well designed, um, and look at what they do. And if you start to notice a pattern that, hey, th this font seems to be used by a lot of really quality websites or apps, um, then you can say, okay, it's safe. Like, this is one that I could go with. And you don't need to know a ton to be able to analyze it or know exactly why you picked that one. Just if you, if you see it and it's good and you and you know it's well respected, go with it. Um, there's plenty of lists of just like good fonts. I know I have one. Um, I wrote a medium article called Seven Rules for Gorgeous UI." Uh, that was back in the day, back in 2014. Although I just updated it, um, and I actually just updated the font recommendation list, which is part of that mega article. And um, so I think there's like five or six recommendations for free fonts. I think they're all free. They might all be Google fonts. I can't remember. Um, but just good ones that are like go-tos if you're trying to make some clean, simple business app. You know, basically you're looking at a sans serif font. So that's the picking fonts. Um, styling fonts is a little bit tougher because there's way more variability. I think the key thing for me with regard to styling fonts and kind of like that key mental breakthrough that I had in going from having no confidence in design to really feeling like I was figuring this stuff out was, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it was to understand, uh, I mean, uh, it's this concept uh, that designers will call hierarchy, although I feel like most normal people call it pop. They say, oh, this text doesn't pop enough. I need it to pop a little more. Um, it's kind of like this trope among freelance designers that clients always ask for things to pop a little bit more. Then you have to decode what that means. But a lot of the times, that means uh, it just needs to be a little more visually present. It needs to attract your attention a little bit more. Um, and so with styling text, I think kind of the critical skill is to realize that Basically, all the ways in which you have to style text, whether that's making it bigger or bolder or changing the color or changing the color of the background, both of those are going to ultimately adjust the contrast, which is the kind of the, the underlying variable that you're you're getting at. Um, changing the size, the color, the weight, uh, the making it italicized or whatever. <clears throat> all of those things are kind of like either contributing to that pop, to that visual weight, or... Um, they're decreasing it. And so you kind of have this slider where whenever you have one piece of text in your interface, you have to ask yourself, is this text drawing the right amount of attention? And do I like how it looks? Um, and if it's drawing, if, if it's drawing the wrong amount of attention, then you know you need it. I mean, this is kind of the simple lesson. It's like, oh, well, uh, this subheader is clearly not being seen. It just, it doesn't feel heavy enough for, for its role. Like the items in the list are overshadowing it. So maybe this subheader, I need to make it pop a little bit more. Like what are my options here? And realizing that you have not just making it bigger, that's kind of the overutilized option. There's also making it darker or making it lighter. Um, there's making it bolder. Uh, there's making it uppercase. Uppercase is something that beginning designers just do far too little of. Um, and if you look at a lot of really nice designs, you're going to see they use uppercase more than you might otherwise expect. Um, so there's there's that. Or if you take if you're looking at a piece of text and you're like, man, I think it's drawing about the right amount of attention. It just doesn't look quite right. Then understanding that all these ways of styling text are just ways of modifying the pop you can move two properties in contrasting directions. So you might make the text uppercase, but then make it lighter. 
Like, and in design programs, certainly the easiest way to make something lighter is to change the opacity. Uh, like in Sketch or Photoshop, you just press seven and it goes to 70% opacity. So if you have some text where you're like, eh, this seems like it's attracting the right attention, it just doesn't look quite as good. It's like try uppercasing it and making it, and then making it bold, but to, to undo the effects of uppercasing it and making it bold, try making it 70% opacity, 60% opacity, see how that looks. Of course, at some point you run into accessibility concerns too, so you can't go too low. But just kind of that understanding that everything is really modifying that pop, that visual weight, to use the proper design term, um, that was really the big breakthrough for me. And I think uh, it'll help a lot of beginning designers. So I do have to ask uh, the question before we go on, um, if you do have a favorite or a go-to font that when you're just starting something that you will always start with. Ooh, yeah. Um, one font that I really like a little bit too much is Freight Text Pro. Um, it's a serif font and it just it just looks great as a body font, but also as a header when you when it's kind of blown up to bigger sizes. Um, it's also really nice. It's not free, but if you have any Adobe Creative Cloud subscription, it's free through um, Adobe fonts or it's no extra charge through Adobe fonts. So that's one that I like quite a bit. Um, as far as Google fonts go, I'm pretty fond of like Fira Sans and Open Sans too. Those are kind of fun, nice ones. So in the in the in the scope of fonts and colors and sort of things, where's the where's the where's the collaborative center <laughs> uh, when it comes from to uh, sort of designers and developers? How can developers and de designers basically lift each other up uh, to sort of guide these principles into play. What, so what helps in that, what helps in that scenario? <clears throat> That's a good question. So you're saying what's the best way for a designer to kind of hand off his or her work, or you're just asking for like, what have I found to be good ways of collaborating? Well, yeah, what's good. What's a good way to collaborate? Because there's a lot of different ways that people sort of approach the yeah. way that design, like some people think that design is separate from the code base. Uh, some people think that, uh, you know, when you start off with design, you've got some low fidelity sort of prototyping experience that you've done, whether that's sketching or whatnot. But then you've got the sort of middle ground where is the designer coding components or something to that sort of design standard that gets handed off as a guide? Like where, what, what, what do you think works best today? Because there's a lot out there and, it all has varying degrees of success in my sort of experience. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that I'm even the best person to, to speak on this. Like, because I came from a developer background, my go-to with my clients, at least, has been to say, hey, if you're working on a web project, like, I'll code, you, I'll code the prototype for it. And <clears throat> a lot of the clients who I work for, they've got some developers, um, not necessarily front-end CSS people. So when I say, hey, I'll... When they hear, hey, I'll write all the CSS for you, it's like, oh, that sounds great. Yes, please. Um, and <clears throat> I certainly don't think that's the typical process. Like, I would not expect that most designers would also learn CSS. Um, but that certainly worked well for me. So, but I don't know. I don't know if there, if there is like a one size fits all best way to work together, hand off the designs to development. What's just what's an example of uh, of a way that's been successful for you? Um, well, yeah, certainly coding up my designs and then being able to leave with a little bit of a system where there's some, you know, there's some series of classes that they can just call, whether it's like, oh, here's, you know, here's the button, here's button class and here's uh button dash dash uh, call to action or, or, you know, it's maybe not a full fledged library in the sense that um, something like bootstrap is. But it's just enough where, like, the classes cover a wide variety of cases. And so there's things that, as a developer, when you say, okay, now I need a, like, this designer who we had on, who we, who we had hired for this project, he's gone. But um, now I need to, like, implement some similar stuff. Like, what can I do? Oh, here's a card class. I guess I could use cards in the same way that we did on this page. And I could use um, these buttons and these input controls, which all have their own styling and classes and, and kind of go from there. Um, that's worked well for me. Um, I find that a lot of the handoff also takes place in documents where, especially if I'm not creating a fully interactive prototype, um, it, someone just needs to kind of write out, like, here's what all these behaviors are. Um, 
when you click this, this needs to happen. This state needs to change. Um, and it's things that are, I mean, even in these designer, um, these design apps like Sketch or uh, Figma, or they have these prototyping fun these proto prototyping functionality where you can kind of click through and see how the app would work, but it has no ability to save, save state. Um, so that becomes a huge issue. And um, at some point, like if I can't code it up entirely, I'm just going to start listing things in a document for like, here's exactly what happens when you click this or you scroll here or you hover here or whatever. Do you find that the animosity there, uh, you know, between sort of designers and developers can be sort of counterintuitive to the end goal? Because I know some, you know, some designers don't want developers to design things like they don't want tweaks to that design. Um, some developers don't want designers to write code because they feel like they're going to have to rewrite it. Um, and that animosity has a tendency to sort of be toxic to, you know, whether it's a deadline or some shipping sort of environment. I mean, how do you how do you see people working through those situations? What do you think the disconnect is uh, between developers and designers a lot of the time that could be cleared up just by some common knowledge per se? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is like platform constraints. Um, Cause again, I'm not going to say that like every designer should know how to code. Uh, but I think one of the main benefits of knowing how to code as a designer, even if you never write a line for the rest of your career, is just kind of having a general understanding of like what's even remote, like what's the order of magnitude of work that this requires. Um, so before we had position sticky, it's like you should know that just saying something was going to be, a st uh, it's going to kind of have that sticky position effect where you scroll down and it sticks to the top of the screen or whatever. It's like that's a little bit tougher than something that's kind of laid out in the usual way. But then, um, you know, there's other things that would be just kind of like downright impossible. Uh, th so this is something that like for me comes up more when I'm designing, um, like say an iPhone app or whatever, because I can't write even the code to do the front end prototype for that. But more than just not being able to write that code, that means oftentimes I won't know whether something is like dead simple, 10 times harder or 100 times harder. And so I'll just kind of blindly assume like, sure, I'm sure we can just do this and we'll have this kind of component, you know, this kind of list component. And then the developer goes, we need to rewrite the whole list component in order to do that. It's like, oh, shoot, I had no idea. Um, so I think a lot of that is about like platform constraints and understanding at least in like this small, medium, large um, level of, uh, of magnification, just understanding like how much work it is to do various things, like how on the table should it be? Because then the designer can say, well, it's actually not all that important that we have this sticky positioning, or it's not all that important that this list function in exactly this way, or maybe it is, who knows? Um, but yeah, that's the biggest thing. It's like the, the platform constraints. So when you sort of have platform constraints and ideally you've got some sort of communication channel between developers, do you feel that those communication channels have gotten better? Because I know that beforehand, a lot of that information wasn't available from a platform perspective. Now we've got sort of design guides uh, specific to platforms. Uh, there's sort of a lot of uh, pre-built existing design systems that are uh, designed with the web in mind, for instance. Do you find that those are communication points of middle ground for a lot of designers and developers today? Hmm. Well, it's. I think it's something that it's definitely gotten harder. Um, just because there's more platforms, they're not necessarily converging anywhere. Um, I would say like in the specific example that I gave of an iPhone app, like trying to read the human interface guidelines that Apple provides about how they're, how they expect their interfaces to work is extremely difficult. And it also kind of walks this, it's not I mean, it seems like it's more clearly for developers than designers, and yet designers would be the ones that like, might benefit more from knowing ahead of time what's kind of on the table in terms of default components or whatever, and what's going to be much more difficult to learn. So, uh, like, we're definitely not in the the best place with respect to that. So we're just about running up against time, and uh, we've asked a lot of questions, Eric, because that's sort of what Danny and I do. You know, we ask the questions and things. Sometimes we have insights. Uh, rarely, though. Rarely for me, at least. Um, what question have we not asked you? What What is the design thing that we just sort of missed that people should know? Ooh, 
That is a really good question. Um, the design thing that you've missed that people should know. Well, as far as the visual design side of thing goes, which is definitely what I spend the most time teaching, certainly, and kind of thinking about how to communicate to other designers. Um, I'd say one of the one of the biggest non obvious lessons that I had to learn was uh, just about alignment and how for most apps that look really nice and well designed, like every element on the entire page is going to be aligned with at least one other element on the page. Um, and this is like almost remarkably universally true. Like you can just open up any app or website that you respect as being very well designed and start look st start looking around. And you'll basically see that like everything is just very well aligned. Um, and so for beginning designers, this is something that's like, like not necessarily intuitive. No one necessarily told you that you needed to do this. And um, even in the process of doing it, it's unclear like do I center these things with each other? Do I like align their tops with text? Do I align the baseline or do I try and center the text in some weird way? It's not even necessarily obvious how you deal with all these sub cases of alignment, but like that's kind of the skill that I might say for beginning designers or someone who's just kind of taking their first stab at this. It's like, that's something that you're almost certainly missing and almost certainly not doing enough of. Um, yeah, so that's just one thing. It's a good question, though. I can give it more thought. Well, if you've got any resources, make sure uh, we'll make sure to get them in the show notes. Uh, but Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, Justin. Thanks. And thanks, Danny. Danny, closing thoughts as we wrap up episode number 181 of the Web Platform Podcast. No, uh, just a, a, apparently I should apologize to the designers. I've uh, uh, berated harshly for using too many shades of gray. <laughs> <laughs> it's always something, Danny. We're always improving. That's the key. Well, with that, this has been episode number 181 of the Web Platform Podcast. Today we've had Eric Kennedy talking about design and the various things around design that, frankly, I still probably need to work on. Uh, tune in next week when we talk more things web, more things platform, more things awesome. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your week. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>